now uh, we have the final uh, talk for or the final session for this uh, conference. And uh, again, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome this time uh, Dr. Rina Burikari from the uh, Joint Re Research Center from the European Union. And I know that you will present yourself during the talk, so I will not uh, do that. So welcome and thank you, uh, thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you. I like the uploads in advance. Uh, I like that idea. Thank you, <laughs> Sweden, for this. <laughs> um, as uh, Frederick already mentioned, I would like to first a little bit explain the place that I'm coming from today. Uh, Joint Research Center is actually part of the European Commission. So I will be taking a very EU look on this talk, and that's only because of my uh, job. I'm doing this. Um, Joint Research Center is there to help EU to create more evidence-based policies. So we want that the policies are made on proper research and proper evidence. And that's the job of uh, JRCs. Uh, there are seven, six different uh, units, and we are actually based all the way in the south of uh, Spain, in Sevilla. So you can imagine arriving from Sevilla to Stockholm yesterday and feeling the cold. We are still at 30 degrees, and I kid you not, I could not sleep because it was over 30 at night. So in a way, as a Nordic, I do celebrate the change of seasons, and uh, it's great also to see the autumn arriving. Uh, my name is Rina Vorikari uh, from Finland. Uh, I will not give you this talk in my second uh, national language, Swedish, because uh, as many Finns, uh, we're a little bit lazy at that. Uh, nowadays, uh, English is almost the second language in Finland, I must say, so I hope you will forgive me that. I've been working in Spain since 2013, and before that, I worked in an organization called European Schoolnet. I worked a lot in implementing new technologies in schools. We worked with ministries of education, we worked with Schoolverket actually from Sweden, and uh, with a lot of uh, EU development projects where we really put the, in the beginning it was about hardware, then it was about software, about the open educational resources and so on in the classroom. So I have a background in teaching, but in the course of the years, I've gone into hypermedia, multimedia, and I've done doctoral studies in exactly that intersection of things. So that's about myself. About my presentation today, it's kind of uh, funny to be talking about digital competence after so many people have already talked about digital competence. But um, irony aside, I think it's very relevant and very telling that everybody has very different take on it. So what I will present today is what European Union means by digital competence. I will, in the second part, I will talk a little bit about digital competence acquisition by really young people, talking about kids from zero to eight year old, so already before they start formal schooling, kindergarten, and so on. That's one of the study areas that uh, JRC is also looking at. And at the end, I will tell you the good news. I will share a little bit of my optimism. I think there is land somewhere there to be seen, and we have a good roadmap. So I think we are on a good way. After each of the sessions, I will have a little summary, and uh, there will be also a chance for you to give a few questions back for me, comment, anything like that. Uh, I know that I'm the last one before you and the weekend, so uh, I see everybody's already on Facebook checking the, you know, barbecue and all that for the weekend. So bear with me a minute. Well, 50 minutes to be precise. So uh, just to give you the context of work, I told you it's about EU things, and for some of us, EU, equals to bureaucracy, Brussels, all the bad things. 
Now there's also a good thing, there's a reason why EU was set up, and I always like to celebrate the fact that it is about the peace, solidarity and democracy. So those are the, really the key uh, aims for EU, and along the way we have things like uh, movement of labor, we have EU uh, euro money, we have other treaties, we have, um, we have directives, just to help us to reach those values. How this works, and this is also to give you an example of my work, so European Commission, this is uh, the Commissioner Navraxis from Hungary, and he is currently the Commissioner of Education, Culture and Youth. And just about three months ago, uh, Juncker's Commission gave a new communication. Communication is an EU slang, and it means this is our action plan for the next two to three years. The one that gives me a remit to work and gives me a remit to do research and find evidence and support people who are making educational policies is a communication called School Development and Excellent Teaching for a Great Start in Life. I will share the slides with you so you will have links so you can look at all the great stuff that they are doing. But big part is about digitalization of schools, of education, and uh, of course the skills acquisition. Another thing that is uh, uh, something that the EU has given out already in 2006, this is the, the key competencies. We have defined at the EU level, these are the uh, competencies that each citizen should have, and they are also something that all the heads of states have signed up for, saying we want to make sure that our citizens have these eight key competencies mother communication in mother tongue, foreign language, mathematical competence, digital competence, competence learning to learn. So we have eight of them and they have all been defined and digital competence being also one of them. What is interesting about digital competence is that it's very transversal. So it's something that allows us to acquire other competencies too. That is also really important when we talk about teaching digital competence. Is it really teaching the operational skills, how to turn computer on, like you're in the plane and they show you, this is how the seatbelt works? Or is it actually going a little bit further? And for us, it is really going a little bit further. We don't mean with the uh, digital competence anything that is just a mere use of ICT tools. There is a really idea that people could use it for employment, learning, self-development, and participation in society. So that's important thing. Another important thing is how we have defined the competence. So competence is really a combination of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So skills being the operational skills, let's say. More the knowledge, more procedural knowledge about things, and then the attitudes is kind of that critical, motivated, inspiring, uh, and so on. So the combination of all these is what we, when we talk about competence. Uh, 2010, my research unit started working on digital competence. It was clear from um, the list, okay, we have a digital competence, we have some kind of a definition, this is what all citizens need, but what does it actually mean? Every country, every person, if you uh, care to ask, seem to have a different definition for it. So when we started the work, we started by looking at a lot of the research out there, a lot of the work by, uh, let's say, ministries, by groups like uh, uh, UNESCO with the uh, Millennium um, information media and information literacy frameworks, uh, national frameworks, and so on. So we looked a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff out there. We did online consultations, what people mean by digital competence. And based on that, we made a proposal by 
to say what does it mean. I go in a second to show you exactly what we mean by it, but just to tell you that we have been thinking of it for a while. So 2010 we started, the first version came out 2013. We updated 2016 our, uh, let's say mostly the terms, because when we started it was still about computers and now when we talk about digital technologies, it's everything. It's wearable stuff, it's your cell phone, it's not only the computer. So that kind of language had to be changed. And now, just since um, summer, we have 2.1, where we actually define also levels. It's not only defining like this is what we mean by digital competence, but also eight levels of digital competence. So, what is this mysterious thing according to EU? Uh, for us, digital competence has five main areas. And they are all divided into competencies. There's 21 competencies that define digital competence as such. Each competence has a definition and there's a little bit of a rich in text, excuse me for that, but uh, you will have also this for yourself later so that you can look at it. But just quickly to go through the areas to introduce them to you, information and data literacy. So this is the typical searching for information, critically evaluate information, and know how to store and retrieve that information back. We have communication and collaboration, and this is how to interact, communicate through digital technologies. But also about participation in society, and this idea of participatory citizenship is very important there, as is nowadays your own digital identity. Understanding that you have one, and understanding that that is actually a tool also to communicate. Digital content creation includes everything, and uh, this includes creating content that could be PowerPoint, it could be uh, spreadsheets, it could be video, it could be a game. So that's why also programming, which appears in our list, is within digital content creation. These three areas, you can imagine that they are very interrelated. It's hard to talk about uh, communication and collaboration without actually sharing some knowledge artifacts. So, of course, you know, then that becomes digital content creation and so on. So, don't be fooled by the idea that this would be bubbles on their own. There's a lot of interrelated things. And then we come to safety and problem solving. And these are really something that penetrates all of the three areas there. Safety to protect devices, content, nowadays very important, personal data. We have personal data directive, effective uh, starting 2018 May. So it's also understanding that kind of things. But what is also really much wider here than the devices is to take this physical, psychological, but also social well-being into the discussion. So talking about bullying, talking about uh, addictions that these digital technologies might create. Uh, physical, of course, being the ergonomics, <laughs> when kids are like this, or we are working like this on a computer. But also the social inclusion. With whom can we communicate? Do we communicate with the world? If we use WhatsApp, if you use Facebook, there are people who are excluded from this. And then we also think about the environment. We bring even the environmental impact into the picture. I'll come back to the problem solving area, but here what is most important is to think this is problem solving not as a competence of, on its own, but it's problem solving within digital competence area. And this goes really from problem solving little technical problems, which might be kind of troubleshooting, but really going into 
thinking, I have a need to do something. I need to call a taxi. Do I look, you know, the number on the internet or do I uh, look at the phone book or do I just uh, get Uber? You know, you have a need and you find a technological response to it. And this is that kind of thinking, but also to innovate, innovate pro products and processes. So the idea, the creation and keeping yourself up to date. So each of the area, I already kind of gave it away, but is defined in uh, like with the header, what you see here, header and each of the competence has its own descriptor. And that is the descriptor that we have for programming. Um, now I personally don't want to get into the discussion coding, programming, computational thinking. The most important thing here for us is the idea that it's included in the, thing, in the idea of digital competence by thinking, not that every citizen has to start uh, programming in EU to, you know, bring the, bring the economical growth and so on. It's more the idea that actually on both sides of the screen, there is a human. You know, humans actually create the algorithms, they create these programs, they create these uh, technologies that we use. And a little bit of this kind of curiosity, maybe also critical thinking towards, um, let's say, some of the search results. When you see like, oh, funny that uh, Google puts these results up on the top. Maybe if you can understand a little bit about uh, uh, content filtering, it might help you to be also critical about some economic gains there that somebody might be after. So I said I'll come to the, uh, the idea of our problem solving within the digital, digitally rich environment that it is, this for me is a, like a really the key, what distinguishes our digital competence framework from a lot of the other frameworks that are out there. If you look at the competencies that we have there, if you compare it to UNESCO's media and information literacy, it's pretty much the same until we come and look at the problem solving. So here, I already uh, mentioned that these two areas are, uh, the first one was the trouble, like technical troubleshooting, but the identifying needs and technological res responses. And this also, includes the idea that you could customize these environments to your own need. So a little bit more taking proactive role there. And creatively using digital technologies. Here I would like to highlight the part to engage in cognitive processing to understand and resolve conceptual problems. So this, for those who have looked at the PISA study and who have looked at the problem solving in PISA, you would realize that this is exactly the same definition. And it includes the individually doing it, but also collaboratively. So uh, that's because we think it's really important that people, um, that it's highlighted in something that we have a common understanding about. So that's why it's included also in our definition. Just to go a little bit further, I said we have uh, 21 competencies defined, and each of the competencies has actually definition on the proficiency levels. We have now eight levels, and sorry about a little bit crappy image there, <laughs> but uh, just to give you an idea here, at the basic level, comes with the idea of uh, guidance, like you're not doing anything alone. Let me just uh, actually go to this one. This, um, has a nicer image also. So in our attempt to define the, let's say, describe the eight proficiency levels, we took the metaphor of um, swimming in a digital ocean. And uh, we have three main things that we are looking at. Uh, complexity of task that you're solving, autonomy, being able to do it alone or with the help, and the third one being the uh, related to Bloom's taxonomy, like the cognitive domain. I said we have eight levels now. You can see them up there. And they are sort of divided in the two. 
So if we look at the autonomy, for example, in a very low level, you might be able to uh, look for information if you're assisted by your mom, by your teacher, by a trainer at the unemployment office, because this is really thinking about all citizens, not only schools. On the level three, four, you're autonomous, you can do it on your own, and on the level five and six, you help somebody else gaining this skill or competence. And the level seven and eight, they are really high level, which probably very few of us are going to be, other than in this crowd here with researchers. This links to the idea of creating new knowledge and being you know, at the leading edge of, uh, of uh, solving also problems in this field that are new. So that's just quickly to show you our elaboration of levels and each of the uh, level has been defined using here, highlighting, identifying my information needs. Identify being a bl from Bloom's taxonomy, one of the main uh, verbs. Find data information through simple search in digital environment. Simple search, again, being that level of uh, complexity of task. So that's to give you an idea of this. And I will, not, uh, I will just show that we have more material on my slides, giving examples and so on, but I will not go in details about that. They are there available for those who are interested. So we have a digital competence framework. We also want to make a tool to help citizens to assess their own digital competence. Because what is important here is that you know where you are and you know if you want to go from level A to level B, that you have kind of a roadmap to get there. Currently, this is under, under construction. My colleagues in, uh, in um, Sevilla are working on a battery of questions. And uh, we will have a pilot uh, testing this tool in um, three member states, and the idea is that we will also test the psychometric properties so that it would be a very reliable and valid instrument. So that's some of the work that we are currently doing, and I will actually just leave it here about digital competence framework. I wonder if somebody has any, any sort of a question now. I know that there's a... Ah, yeah. There's a lot of information. It's a little bit boring, but I thought to take the time to explain to everybody what we actually mean by this. And it's probably a good moment also for you now in Sweden, because you're really in the process of, uh, of working on it. Uh, I, I was wondering, because, it, because it's very interesting to f see this kind of framework. And of course, we have been looking at it while we were working on our national strategy and so on. Uh, uh, not the latest ver version, though, because that was later. Uh, my question would relate to how is this used throughout Europe? Uh, can you give us a, a, a uh, yeah. picture of how, how, may, how, how widely spread it is and how, in what way different countries are adopting it? Yeah, that's actually that's a good question, and we have a huge variety. I have a slide here. I was not going to necessarily use it, but um, here. Um, I have four groups of people, or uh, let's say tasks, where the DICCOM framework has been used in different countries. Um, one being the teacher professional development, that actually came up already today a little bit in the discussion. So in some countries, uh, they're taking the DICCOM framework uh, in the teacher training institutes, and they have uh, worked it in to the program, so that teachers also, as a citizens, will be digitally skilled to teach in schools. Another area, uh, education and training content, that's the blue one, and student assessment. So some countries, like Estonia this year, will for the first time, all the ninth graders going out of school, they will test them for their digital competence. So they've been working on an eval um, evaluation tool, and uh, they want to do that for all students leaving compulsory education. 
to give a few ideas. France has a similar tool called PIX, and uh, it's then for all citizens. They can go on a platform, take a test, get their own self-assessment. If they are interested, they can go to a center where they can get certified for that. We have also ways where it's used in employment offices. So people who are unemployed uh, in Basque Country, they worked on creating profiles for different jobs. And this is quite interesting. If you look at the long list of 21 competencies, we can ask, does everybody really need those all? But what they have done, they said for these job profiles, you would need to be on level one in this competence area and level two on that competence area. So based on that, they can give training for people who are out of jobs. So those are some, um, some ideas. And maybe also to say, uh, just late last uh, Germany, uh, this spring, they made a new big strategy, a little bit like here in the, they're creating new curriculum in all lenders. This was um, a big thing, uh, including media, uh, education and also digital competence. So they used a little bit parts of our competence framework, mixed it into their own. So there's a similar work also going on in Germany. So that might be interesting. Just to maybe sum up here, the part one. So the idea was really to give Europe a tool where we can talk about digital competence development and we can all agree that this is what we mean. So a common definition, an understanding, so that we can have tools to work together somewhere towards the same goal. And also, the tool is there for policymakers, really in the national level, regional level, EU level, to take that tool and work it into their national policies curriculum, even in the school for teachers and so on. So that's just summarizing part one. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time now also to talk about the digital competence acquisition. We've talked a lot about schools and it is a problem. Oh, well, it is an issue, let's say. It is a challenge to be a positive. But um, it's very rarely that people actually look at the preschools, like we heard Susanne speaking a little bit earlier. That was really actually super interesting to me. But also, like in this case, really the kids who are three years old, two years old, four years old, and this is uh, just a funny little uh, thing dad saying, I realized that my three-year-old toddler was addicted to iPad when uh, the little kid comes up at four o'clock to wake up the parent like, hey, I need my iPad. So <laughs> this is maybe a moment of reflection. So when we like, start looking at the research, we realize that there's, you know, kids are using these technologies younger and younger. And it's really freaky almost to think like, a, oh yeah, digital competence acquisition for two years old. What are you talking about? But really, like, we are not talking about anything formal, but it comes with the play, like we saw in the, in the earlier presentation. And when you look at the studies, though, you know, we, they, they only start from the age eight, seven, eight upwards, when uh, children are already at school. So my colleagues had a, you know, very good point asking, what about the kids before they come to school? Now everybody has a tablets at home, parents have smartphone, uh, siblings, all the siblings have things to play with. So what do kids do actually with these devices? And actually like how parents mediate this use. And uh, especially for these uh, uh, colleagues, they are really look at the beneficial part of it, but mostly they were interested in the risks because they come from the unit of digital society and security. So already, uh, this is uh, 2015, uh, there was the first uh, study, very qualitative uh, exploratory study on six countries, 
uh, on the zero to eight year olds use of digital technology. And now the new one is coming out really at the end of the year. And why I'm talking about it now is because uh, I had a chance to work with my colleagues and look at it, this data through digital competence framework that I was just talking about. So this was a really interesting way they conducted the research. In every country they collected, they had a sample of 10 families who had kids from zero to eight and up. And they went to these families and they had interviews there. But of course you're like, so how are you going to interview a two-year-old? <laughs> and uh, are they getting a survey questionnaire? So actually they used these little play cards. And so it was very much kind of a play uh, type of um, uh, interview. And of course then just observing kids uh, using tablets or smartphones like that. And then here I have just a few little pickups from the, the data. So everything is very qualitative, so it's a descriptive data. And it was really quite um, enlightening for me to think that I don't have children myself, so I only see it happening on the side. But this, like, a, how do really kids who don't know how to read and write, how do they start using, like, what do they do on the internet? Like here, these boys, um, they didn't know actually, let me see, here, the voice, uh, the voice part. They were using the voice search in Google, but they are in a country, they were actually in Romania. So it doesn't really work that well in Romanian. So they were asking my friend, my friend who was the, the researcher, like, um, they tried to say, oh gee, it was some Disney figure, but they pronounced it in a very Romanian way. So then the Google didn't recognize it. So my colleague had to pronounce it and teach these kids how to pronounce it in English so that they could get the stuff out. So that was really intriguing. This little girl, she didn't know how to write yet, but the brother had written the search words for her for some games on the paper that was on the side of the computer, and she would figure them out. Uh, mostly like here, uh, it says that they were looking for videos, games, and they would just go by the, in the smart TV, like by the icons. So icons used were a lot for navigation. And then of course parents who were around. Always when they ran into a problem, it was turning into a parent or sibling or friend for help. But these are just uh, some uh, uh, examples of uh, like digital literacy and uh, skills acquisition at the very, very early level. And of course there, if you think of our classification and the proficiency levels, this is often autonomy, knowing how to do it, but with the help of somebody else. We had actually so much more collaboration and communication things than actually producing content. It was interesting, I commented about it to Susan that uh, we had, um, maybe that's the difference being uh, observing in a kindergarten and observing at home, that you actually see that they used it a lot for um, talking with their parents. And this was a little freaky for me. They would use their parents' Facebook accounts to communicate with their relatives. Or like in this one, mom was working abroad in another country and she had left at home a computer open with, with her Facebook and she would send messages to the girl who would read it at home. So that was kind of an interesting, and pictures then from her day at work, you know, abroad. So that was a way for them to communicate and share everyday life and everyday experiences. So still be part of the daily life, even though you're not physically there. So cute examples. Content creation, she loves to take photos and shares them publicly on mom's Facebook. So then there was one mom who was really got actually upset only at the point where the kid had taken picture of her sleeping <laughs> and shared it on the Facebook, on her Facebook account. 
And then there was a kid who had purchased 3,000 euro car from uh, Polish eBay. So there was all kinds of things. <laughs> but just to illustrate also that um, a lot of the kids were not very aware of uh, sort of threats or uh, you know, bad things online. But this is uh, one kid who was uh, aware of online risks because once the computer had been broken by a virus. So that's a kind of cute way of saying it. And then there was the issue, you know, the kids said like, well, I would actually like to put a password on my computer or my tablet, but the mom didn't, because then the mom would lose control over checking what's happening on her life, what kind of things she's looking for, what games she's playing, downloading, and so on. So this is just to illustrate the variety. There was a lot more, of course, but that's from the, f um, these recommendations are from the first study, and the new recommendations are coming out, but these are still very valid. When they interviewed the kids, they interviewed the parents, what we realized is that uh, parents actually need some help with this. Parents and caretakers, they, it's kind of an open play field with no actually guidance, no rules, it's like, go get, it, get there and get dirty and, uh, you know, so far so good. That's how kids learn. But at the same time, if we're thinking of uh, leveling the playground and offering also a secure digital life for these kids, it could be good to have some recommendations. And these kind of mediation strategies for parents, how to talk also about um, managing and... Uh, mediating online risks, information also about positive effects of, uh, the cr for the creativity, the content creation part. Uh, parents actually didn't use a lot about the educational games that are out there or tools, it appears. And of course, this whole idea of uh, practical information and ideas, you know, how to actually deal with those things uh, would be very important. And also to bring this to preschool, daycare. In a lot of countries that were observed in this data, they uh, didn't have any digital part in the preschools, like what we heard today. But in a few Nordic countries and the Netherlands, where they had this kind of programs, they could already see that the kids had very different way of playing with that. So just to summarize this part, uh, I said the kids might have superpowers, but they are not necessarily digital ones, because what we could see is that this skills acquisition was actually sort of very repetitive. It was a lot of trial and errors, and very, I have a good word for it, coincidental consumption. This was something that Susan used today, and uh, I thought it was a very good term. What comes out from that data is like they just come across some game and they play it, and then they come across another game and they play it. And then how do they get back to that game that they liked first? It's something like sometimes they see the link in Google is underlined. So, you know, that kind of things. But they just copy what their parents are doing. And that is fine because that's how kids learn. But if you look at the other side of it, it really creates this really patchy, uneven, playground. And if we think about the balanced uh, online life, you know, for everybody in the, in the EU, it is, uh, the playground is already, you know, the play field is so uneven by the time they come to school that teachers have even a harder job getting started with all this. So there is some, you know, reflection to be done for all of us, but I hope somehow that EU also could be part of that kind of thinking. If I just quickly get a few questions, if, do you have any comments? <laughs> you, can, you can try if they can talk to your camera. <laughs> oh yeah, I should, uh, I, I have one here. Well. What would you say was the greatest concern among parents about younger children's use of digital media? 
Well, for me, like what came out was uh, actually the fact that they were not so concerned. I was, that was scary for me, that they were very um, knowledgeable about the fact that they will at one point start uh, giving some strategies for youngsters, but they were thinking like, okay, when they go to school, they will talk about those things and then we'll deal with that then. And for me, that was really scary. And I also like, uh, I'm looking at these devices as personal devices. They were planned to be personal cell phone, personal tablet, and then they are shared with everybody. You know, you might have your personal data there, your pictures, your banking information, and then it's just in a child of uh, somebody, you know, your dear child. <laughs> but uh, for me, that was also a little scary, that part. But surprisingly little came out in the data. Is that something you've seen yourself also? No? No. Okay. I have a question with the kids and the framework you talked about earlier. Yep. Is there like a recommendation at what age you should be at what level or is there like more of a this is the path you should go through in a lifetime? Well, that's a very good question and no, we don't have any recommendations at the EU level. It's really, this is something that is left uh, for each country and each uh, region <laughs> or whatever municipality you have to decide. But that is, uh, you know, also when you look at the research, which is where I would go first and look like, okay, what does the research say? We don't have any very conclusive results. Uh, there are some, like, um, I think American Periodic, uh, no, Association for the, what's the little kids association, like at the doctors who, pediatric. pediatric association has some recommendations for screen time also, but then other people say like, well, everybody watch, watches TV, you know, what's the thing? And uh, so it's, uh, it's really a field that we don't have enough evidence, we haven't collected the evidence, and we're still kind of now saying like, well, we didn't do it before, let's not do it now. You know, <laughs> we should start a good project on that to understand better. Maybe there's not really a requirement where you should be, but maybe it is also like looking at those pathways, how do you get somewhere where you want to be? Because like if you want to become, a, let's say, data scientist uh, when you grow up, you know, it's good to know X, Y, and Z. It went green. And I was going to ask about regulatory frameworks because some of the phenomena that you described there actually are influenced by the companies who implement the product. So, for instance, I communicate with my sister's daughter by my sister's, or via my sister's Skype account. Uh, now, why is that? Well, it's because you can't create a Skype account for a person at that age. So, you either lie about their age yeah. or, or so, whatever. So... And of course, because we're in some sense all fictitious people now, you know, I could be 102. Uh, I yeah. could live... Be a dog on yeah, the Yeah, e exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> whilst there's no real way of checking, there are still these requirements. And I think it, it biases parents' behaviour because they're rule-following and they're trying to be right and they're trying to do the right thing. And then, well, I can't create a Skype account for my daughter because she's only five. Right. Uh, or a or Facebook account. Or I can't have a account. Facebook account yeah. because they're under the age of whatever it is that Facebook requires. Um, and then what happens is that you, you loan stuff out. And that's yeah. untraceable. And yeah. probably more dangerous, actually, than understanding what was going on. Exactly. Well, that's a good sort of research question I must, uh, you know, pass on to my colleagues because maybe exactly how much of that behaviour of... Uh, kids using their parents' account on Facebook is exactly that. The parents want to be rule followers and uh, therefore the kids th doesn't have it. Or then you have kids who are really eight-year-olds and they already have their accounts and there you go like, hmm, I don't know if that's a good thing either. Uh, another thing that is a little bit scary here is the um, parents, like the apps, you know, downloading free apps, these games, and all the advertisement that is within it. And uh, you probably also know about the privacy. 
there that a lot of the apps actually collect a lot of the data from your phone. They might, you know, check the location data. They might look at the phone numbers, the messaging. There's uh, all kinds of things that you think they are, they're not relevant. Why would they need this information? But there seems to be a whole information uh, uh, consumption culture behind, and that's why they sell them for free. But the, the whole that kind of thinking also for parents, you know, these so-called free accounts, Google is free to use, but they actually collect a lot of data about you, about the people you uh, communicate, the same with uh, Facebook. So all that kind of comes into a little bit this, not necessarily security, but I like the skills for kids that Susan had, like the thinking about the critical thinking, equity and ethics. You know, this kind of like the little kids should already be somehow immersed into that, I think. But yeah, so quickly, I will just uh, share with you a little bit of my optimism. I think, you know, we're in a good way. And uh, there is now research coming out that we actually know that there are no digital natives. You know, and uh, that's what I also said to my colleagues when they did this research that actually, you know, this data totally shows, you know, busts the myth of digital natives being there. They are just normal kids who learn by imitating everything what is around them and sort of trial and error. So from that point of view, there was the, I mentioned already uh, uh, Kirchner from uh, Open University. And he has looked at a little bit into this kind of a research. And what he says about this idea of digital natives, he argues that we hurt students rather than help them to learn when we assume that they have already certain technological unique skills. So that just brings back my optimism about the new curriculum in Sweden. I think it's great that we have actually put names, labels on things and said, okay, now in schools we do have to pay attention to this thing of digital competence. And I also hail very high this idea of uh, creating teacher uh, professional development material. Actually, um, I was looking a lot into these modules that are out on Schoolwerket's portal and the model of uh, teacher training behind these modules where you discuss at school with your colleagues and you have a sort of facilitator for the discussion and you try out something in a classroom, that is really in the research we've shown that that's the one of the most effective teacher development model. So I, you know, would really love to see a lot of uh, teachers taking up these models, modules here and uh, start really putting these labels on behavior that we do and say like, okay, let's now go and teach about this uh, active, for example, uh, uh, information, uh, looking for information on the internet in a critical way. So now just to show you like, these are the DICOM competencies, you know them by now. So for example, the digitalization modules, so they really also treat the same stuff. The, the content is really almost one-to-one -one in some areas to what I have been talking about in DICOMP, the critically using internet. Here the digital storytelling where you uh, create material, you communicate, you collaborate. So those are really those skills and those courses should give the confidence for teachers to use this uh, ideas in the classroom, bring them there, but also to give them a good attitude towards these digital technologies. Because from the previous research, we know that one of the factors most important about digital integration of digital in classroom practices is teachers' attitude. If they have positive attitude themselves towards digital technologies, they are more likely to use them in the classroom. So these are also ways to work on that positive attitude. And just to uh, finish up some take-home messages, I was trying to look for a cool map, and then I went to Flickr, and I wanted to find something with the Creative Commons licenses that I could reuse, and I couldn't find anything. So this map is from Sevilla in the uh, 1560s. 
and uh, I live right there. <laughs> it's just also to show this is exactly the time when uh, the golden period in Spain started and when uh, Columbus actually uh, departed to uh, find the Indies, the route to India, which was incidentally found Americas there, but uh, that's where they left. So uh, this is, uh, we have a vision and you have now a mandate to work in, the, in your curriculum. So I think um, it's, uh, let's say, there are a few things I wanted to say. We have tools. We have uh, like the DICOMP tool that teachers are able to find and use for their development purposes, and, but also bringing in the classroom. Uh, there, there's also a little game here, you know, my colleagues uh, who look at the, all these um, security things, they created a game that you can use to play and raise awareness of risks and opportunities. We have also a quite big project in my team, which is actually not only looking at the digitalization of schools as such, or bringing digital competence there, but it's really looking at the school as a digital learning organization. And that's uh, where I want to stop. And I'll just show you this uh, idea. The tool itself has um, seven or eight areas. And uh, they are areas that if a school wants to start implementing these kind of digital sort of, um, let's say, change in the way they have done things before and how they want to change also way of do doing things. You have to look at a lot of things, you know, there's the infrastructure, there's also something related to content, curriculum being there, very important, the learning and teaching practices, uh, assessment practices that are used in school, leadership, so that your school actually creates a common vision where all the teachers, students, parents also buy in to make that change. And now we've been talking a lot about, you know, what about computational thinking? They should be thinking technologies too. They should be thinking learning and math. What we have to do is try to find a win-win situation. And for that, you know, digital competence is great because like I started saying, it's transversal. It cuts through a lot of issues. So bringing it in the school in a way that it doesn't take away anything from other subjects is important because you don't want to <laughs> go to school and you know, start picking with your colleague like, no, my thing is more important than your thing. You're not going to get anywhere there. So try to create win-wins. Uh, get your hands dirty. There's a lot of things to do. You know, you're, you have a great start, but there's still, you know, road ahead in Sweden. Think how do you define success, you know? How do you know that you're successful in that, what you're doing? Now with changing, you know, <coughs> implementing new curriculum. And celebrate the good moments that you have and celebrate the change. Create some reward for change because we don't have really reward structures in schools. And that's also, you know, why they always remain so uh, old-fashioned. Because we don't really, you know, it, it's not a place where things happen and change. And this is a lot of changes, you know. So that would be my take-home message for you. And I hope some of the tools that we've developed in uh, JRC uh, are going to help you on the way. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. So, questions? Oh, at the back, the neuroscientist. Let's see. Uh, I have a question regarding this evaluation tool you've been developing. So, would you predict that the digital literacy will go up with time with the children come out of school well sort of the old people dying off or do you think that this will be stratified by IQ for instance and be a constant thing wow 
Let me take my <laughs> crystal ball out, <laughs> you know. Does anybody else have an answer for that <laughs> idea, comment? Well, definitely, you know, like also what we uh, see with any digital literacies, it is the second uh, sort of, um, it's not the have computers at home or have uh, phones, you know, that was the first uh, digital gap. The second one is like the, that comes from a social and economic background. You know, kids in homes, disadvantaged homes, they use them very differently. And they use them, we, we have studies, we have actually studies coming out now. My colleague looked at the PISA data there and disadvantaged students, and they actually saw that for certain disadvantaged students, using these di technologies in schools was actually really good because it helped to bring that, you know, them up to the level that other kids in some homes already had to start with. So uh, I think that d the division will remain, you know when it, we are not. Plus, there's like, if you look at the north-south division in Europe, that's huge, but also now the east-west um, is uh, starting to also emerge. So I think the digital literacy will be as divided as uh, some uh, parts in Europe, some, <coughs> yeah, will be in education, in, uh, yeah, social. But do you think spheres. it will be kind of, I mean, because you could also argue that it could be a way of putting people together that I mean of course they have different kind of living conditions and so on yeah but depending on where but they live but the the digital world in some sense is available to everyone and uh, that's if they are given that opportunity and that's why I would look at the schools exactly as a place where they could you know <coughs> start hanging out like uh, there are d programs that I love I'm a big fan of e-twinning. I don't know if anybody knows e-twinning. It's a European school project where a uh, school in Finland could find a school in Spain and they could, you know, over Skype do some discussions and uh, talk about Christmas in Finland and in uh, Spain. And there you learn languages, you learn the culture, you learn something about the societal values. And those are the things that I would really love to see more learned through technologies, because technologies can exactly like, you know, take a lot of the barriers away, but there's just a way to get there is uh, you need uh, time in schools, you need uh, resources, there's a lot of things, but if we really make that the goal, I'm sure we can make it. Excellent. Thank Positive. you. <laughs>